So it's nice to see you all here. Welcome. Uh, I am Miss Nergis, your university counselor. Some of you may have already known me, but um, I am waiting others uh, to meet uh, to meet and work with. Um, so today our year 13 universities, uh, 13 years students, um, we all together decided to have this session um, for our year 10, 11, 12 students who want to uh, apply to university and start this process. Um, uh, they have already finished uh, this uh, process and you know that they are uh, they are about to finishing our school and start their uh, life journey and we decided um, to have this seminar with you they want to uh, share their experience and give their advice to you so uh, we will have different students uh, uh, from different uh, who apply to different universities with different um, programs and uh, today they will share their experience with you. Um, we have um, students who apply to Canada, to UK, to uh, European universities and as well as the USA. In the end we will, you will be given 15 minutes for a question and answer session. So I will start with A-levels. What are A-levels? Um, A-levels are subject-based two-year course and uh, it will lead you to the uh, your dream university or your dream career future. Uh, before deciding a level, you have to make sure which faculty you want to study in and in which course you are good at. Please remember that you will be having this course two years of period and you will have a deep uh, learning knowledge about it. So, uh, tips on choosing uh, a level subject. What are the tips? You have to, before choosing this, you have to make sure if you like this subject, if you are good at in subject. And again, remember that in two years, um, you have you you should have um, good interest, so you can continue studying this two years course uh, in depth. So before starting, before starting to make decision, please have a search on the internet. And it will be better if you have an idea which university you want to study, you want to apply. Because each university may have different entry requirements. And there are also uh, facilitating subjects, please next uh, slide, uh, facilitating subjects that might be very helpful to you. So, as I told before, as I said before, some university might have certain uh, entry requirements and one of them, uh, their subject might be this subject. They are sub uh, chemistry, physics, biology, English, math and others. So make sure you have at least one of or two of these subjects. And also, having one or two of these subjects may give you a um, better choice. Uh, so, so before having these, these decisions, I would um, suggest you have a deep uh, um, investigation of the university webpage and make sure which uh, subjects they require. And it was a for short introduction um, for a level. Uh, you can come to me uh, for any with any questions. So uh, my office is on the second floor next to Mr. Lander's office and also here I have my email address please uh, make sure you email me or you can come and visit me there so now I will give the speech to um, Anna she will be introducing your UK universities and a short introduction about UCAS All right, so hey everyone my name is Anna and I'm in year 13 um, and today I'll be giving you my personal insight on how to apply to the UK and kind of, um, you know, help you through the application process. So, first and foremost, when you're given the opportunity to travel around the world to study, you're going to know, you're going to want to know why and where you're going. So, there are good reasons why you should choose the UK. Um, first of all, there are amazing universities. I definitely invite you to go to the list of the rest of group unis. Um, there are unis like Oxford, Cambridge, UCL, all those great unis and then Exit and Nottingham as well that are really known for most of the courses you want to be applying to. 
Um, then there also uh, is the benefit of having very short courses. So through four years, you can actually do undergrad and postgrad, which is pretty amazing considering the fact that in most other countries, four years is just for an undergrad. Um, you'll also be um, given the great thing of an application fee that is very, very low um, in other countries, and you'll hear about that later. Usually, if you apply to just one uni, it'll cost you $100, and for the UK, up to five choices will just cost you £26. So even if you're not sure on the UK, it's always good to explore and, you know, not shut your doors straight away. Um, then you have the logical continuation of your studies here. You do IGCSEs, you do A-levels, so usually you won't be asked anything else from unis other than just your application and your personal statement, which is great because obviously when you apply, you're going to need to apply for accommodation as well and, you know, just make sure that you balance your finances and do all of these huge documents. So the fact that all your qualifications are already well considered is great for you. And then finally, the fun fact, and the best thing about the UK is that for courses like medicine and law that I've picked personally, you can start straight away. So if you're sure that you want to be a lawyer, if you're sure you want to be a doctor, you don't need to waste four years on another course that is obviously related to what you want to do, but not specific. So um, again, applying to the UK is pretty straightforward. You go through a portal that's called UCAS. Again, you can apply to Scotland, Northern Ireland, and England. You will give your personal information, and then the rest is your qualifications and just your personal statement. You'll be given the opportunity to apply to five schools maximum. So um, the advice that I was given and that I'd give you is to really uh, you know, think strategic um, with that. You pick a reach, so a school that you know, you know your grades, you look at entry requirements, you think you could reach it, but you're not sure. And then I'd say two or three that are reachable that you know you'll get, because obviously if you don't get any offers, it's, it's pretty sad, especially if the UK is your top choice. And then just a safe choice to make sure that you at least get one offer if you, know, you don't do well in exams and that happens. Um, finally, you'll need to be asked, I mean, you'll be asked to obviously pay the fee, but also write your personal statement. This is the most important part, I'd say, of your um, application because it's your personal document. It's a statement, but it's about you, and it's the only thing that really, the admissions will really get from you personally. So, for personal statements, do's and don'ts. Obviously, um, it's a not very, very long. You'll only be given 47 lines, I think, to write your personal statement. So obviously for those who think it's a lot, it really isn't. Um, you'll be asked to basically talk about your passion and why you are fitted for it. Unis receive more than 10,000 applications usually per year, so you really want to make sure that you stand out from the crowd. Um, it's not a CV, so obviously when you'll start your personal statements, uh, some are tempted to just, you know, bullet points what you've done in life. And it's great, but you need to make sure that you tailor it to really show your passion and show why you're fitted for your course. If the admissions just see what you've done in the past, great, they'll think you're amazing, they'll think you're, you know, they'll even be surprised that you've done so much in 18 years, but you need to make sure that you show how it relates to your passion and how you, you know, how it makes you a good fit for the course you wish to do. Um, don't make it hard to read. Um, the admissions people will probably be reading it on a Friday night, they'll be tired, they don't want to be struggling to read what you're trying to say. Um, you know, don't try to impress them, they've done you, they've done so many other things and they really probably won't be impressed and will find it probably complex. Um, don't introduce yourself, keep in mind that you'll be giving them personal information like your date of birth, who you are, so don't, you know, if I said hello, my name is Anna, well that's already probably one line that I've wasted in my 47 lines that I could have used to show my passion. And finally, that's the best advice I've been given, show but don't tell. Don't say, I've done English literature A-levels like I have, and it has, you know, taught me to read and the commitment to read. They know that. They know that most of the students that have applied for law, for example, have done some sort of language A-level. They know you can read, they know you can write. Just show how it really relates to your course. So now, um, obviously, some of you are year 12, and year 11, and year 10, and that's great, and you still have time, but make sure to ask yourself these questions before. Because, for example, we were put in the situation where we were during COVID, and we 
you know, some of us hadn't prepared before and we're like, oh, well, now I need work experience. I can't do that during COVID. Make sure you prepare in advance because the application process is really, really complex and long. <laughs> so you need to be prepared. Ask yourself, do I have work experience? It's great to show that you've done some sort of professional adult work thing before you start your course at ENU. Do I have a hobby? Do you do something outside of school or are you just really just into studies? Um, do I excel in a particular subject? That's great to be starting, you know, to just pick your course. I want to do law, I like languages, I like politics. Well, that kind of goes together. Um, what qualities do I have? It's a weird one, but you know, if you could just one night not watch Netflix and just ask yourself in your room, am I, what am I cool? Like, am I cool? What do I do? Is it, am I good at this? Am I not good at that? And just kind of see if you can portray that in your personal statement. Do you read? That's a really important one because that's all you'll be doing at uni. That's a big part of uni. You need to make sure you do show that you are okay with reading. And then finally, a personal statement is really, really personal, so make sure that you do make yourself stand out in some way. So finally, um, in the UK, you'll usually get a conditional offer, so you need to make sure you meet those conditions. Um, so when you apply, just make sure you continue working. Um, obviously, you'll have to make sure that you do um, have a visa if you need one, because with Brexit, most of you will need to apply for it when you get your results. Um, stay aware of interview dates and emails you'll be sent. Warwick Uni sent me an email and they were like, we need to know if you think schools, yes or no, please confirm before we process your uni, like, your uni application. If you don't, if you don't see those emails, they won't be able to accept or reject you, so you'll just be put on hold. Please don't stress if your friends are receiving offers and you are in. Um, I've been through it, I applied in October, only started receiving offers in March. It's a long time, but sometimes, you know, it's worth it, you'll get offers. And then if you do get your offers, well then just pick a firm and that'll be the uni you are definitely going to if you meet the requirements. And then an insurance and that's if you don't meet the first requirements. Other than that, obviously keep in mind that if you don't get your offers, it's okay because you'll get accepted somewhere and there are many other routes you can go through. And then obviously sit back and relax for it. <laughs> it's hard to say, but just sit and relax when you get your offers because things will happen and everyone is, you know, going through the same thing. So just to give you a bit of you know, my background, I've done politics, English literature, and French A-levels. I had to sit the LMAT because um, it's an examination to kind of show your ability to read and write for law. You'll have to make sure that you do sign up for that. And I think there's also UCAT as a test for the ones that want to do medicine. And then, um, so I plan on doing a double jurisdiction degree at Queen Mary. So that's English law and French law. So if anyone at the end has questions about law, just please let me know. Thank you. other document like IELTS or TOEFL, 
but some universities will still want them, so you just need to make sure you check it. And where you will get this document of proof is from Ms. Nargis. She will write you a letter saying, this person has studied in ABC from this year to this year all in English courses. So there are two ways of applying to Canadian universities. If you are applying to Ontario, you will have to use a portal called OYAC, uh, where you will apply to for more than one university, like U of T and etc. What you do is you just sign up, uh, give your background information, pay for the submission, and then you will get the information for each university. So this is the way you can use if you are applying to more than one university in Ontario. But if you are applying to one university, you do not need to use this uh, portal. You can just apply directly to their university website. If you are applying to a university that's not in Ontario, you will use direct application method, where you just create an uh, account and submit your documents and just wait for the results. How you submit your documents depends and uh, be explained. Um, there are four cases how you can submit your documents. You either submit them by yourself into the portal, you either ask Ms. Nargis or someone else to submit it for you into the portal, you either email it to them or you ask Ms. Nargis to email it to them. That's basically how you will submit your documents. Once you get your letter of admission, you really should start with the visa because it takes like four or five months for you to get the visa and only after you get the visa you will be able to arrange some uh, accommodation with the university so if you do it faster you will get it faster and this will guarantee you a place in the campus if you want to stay in the campus and about my experience I'm, uh, I'm doing for a levels right now three sciences and math I'm applying to Faculty of Science in Memorial University and my plan is to do medicine afterwards. So after I finish my undergraduate degree in science, and I will apply for medicine. Thank you everyone. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Tiana and today I'm going to talk about applying to the general application, the general university application process in Europe. So first I want to introduce you to the main uh, points of our discussion today. Today we're going to talk about the general benefits of why to choose to study in Europe, uh, the general points to consider before applying to Europe, the documents you will need for your application, the application process itself, and anything that comes after that. So why to choose, why, so why to study in Europe? First of all, studying in Europe is a lot cheaper compared to the US, UK or Canada. Your, um, your average tuition fee will come to about 6,000 to 15,000 euros compared to like 40,000 in other countries. Your living expenses will also be a lot cheaper than in the other countries and they will come to about 1,000 euros per month including the, the monthly accommodation rent. Uh, studying in Europe will also provide you with an opportunity to study a new language from the native speakers, which I feel like is an amazing uh, benefit, because no matter what field you go into, it's really beneficial for you to know an extra language. Studying in Europe, uh, Europe also has a really high quality of life. Um, the healthcare is free in Europe, although you might need to get the medical insurance, in my case I applied to the Netherlands and my medical insurance will be, my, the medical insurance is overall a bit costly for me, it's going to come to about 500, 600 euros a year, but uh, again a lot cheaper than in the other countries. Um, and Europe also has a pretty low unemployment rate. Finally, probably the best uh, advantage of studying in Europe is that you only need one visa to be able to travel to 26 different countries of the Schengen area, which I feel like is a good choice for all the, for all the students since you can travel a lot of places for the minimum amount of money. Uh, now some of the factors to 
consider before applying to you? So first of all, you guys need to know that in, in order to get straight into bachelors, you have to finish your full A-levels. If you don't apply with full A-levels and apply with SATs, you will have to study the university undergraduate course, which is also known as foundation. Unless you're doing medicine, if you want to get into medicine after year 12, uh, it won't be a possibility for you. An alternative for that would be for you to apply with SATs if you want to go straight into bachelors in Europe. Uh, also, if you're considering of um, if you're considering of applying to Germany or Australia, you will have or Austria, you will have to provide your university with your German certificate. So you have to know at least some German to study in uh, either of these two countries. Also, many universities in Europe do not offer places to underage students, so you have to be 18 at the start of the course in order to be admitted. But again, you have to clarify that with your university. Uh, it will probably be mentioned on the university's official website. Um, also, unfortunately, uh, also unfortunately, not a lot of universities in Europe offer scholarships, which is um, a bit sad. But uh, if they offer scholarships, the scholarships are the merit-based scholarships. So you have to be uh, an outstanding student. At, an outstanding student on the top of your class with perfect grades. Uh, and yeah, and if they offer scholarship, the scholarship usually covers your whole uh, tuition fee plus some of the accommodation. And yeah, and you will also have to sit an entrance exam if you're applying to Europe. potential documents you might need to apply to Europe. So you'll have to provide your university with an IGC certificate if you're applying with A-levels. Uh, also your school reports for the past two to five years, which I know may sound like a lot, but trust me, trust the process. Uh, you will also need your English proficiency test and German if it's required, and I'll get uh, into that more into that in a second. Also your A-levels if you're applying with A-levels. And sometimes the universities also ask for your AS level certificates, but not usually. Uh, also, if you're applying with SATs, you will have to provide your university with your SAT score, and I'll also get that in more into that in a second. You also have to provide the university with one to two reference letters from your teachers, so please be nice to your teachers and be active on the lessons. You'll, as well as that, you will also need to provide the university with a motivation letter. The topic of the motivation letter will be listed on the university website. So you either have to write about why you chose the particular course in the particular university or a separate topic to write about. Um, and the last two things are, in, are your CV, the European type CV of course, and your high school diploma. If you're applying with SATs, you will have to provide the university with your uh, Azerbaijani state diploma, if not, just your A-levels. Also, you should know that if you're considering sitting the SAT subject specifics, they're no long they will no longer be considered by the European universities, so don't waste your time and just do the general SATs that are out of 1,600 that are just math and English. Slide. Oh, now let's talk about the language proficiency. So most of the Europe, uh, European universities require you to have an IELTS score of more than 6 and 6.0 on each of the four, let's say, um, parts of the SAT exam or TOEFL over 92. Uh, if you don't want to spend 300 monat and stress out and write an IELTS exam, you can ask me like this to provide you with a document stating that you've been studying in an international school for the n number of years. Uh, and finally, you also need to provide your university with a German language certificate if you're applying to Germany or Austria, and you should speak German at least the B2 level. Uh, now the general application process. So first of all, you guys have to double check your deadlines, and I mean double and triple check your deadlines, because I applied to my university two days before the deadline because I wasn't aware of when I was supposed to apply. The university, the application process usually starts in the end of December, throughout January. 
Um, yeah, then you should also check what documents your university needs and prepare them beforehand because again I had to get my uh, predicted A levels done in like a day or so which was a bit stressful for my teachers. Uh, also check your university requires you to sit an entrance exam because in some cases you will have to separately register for the entrance exam. Also see if your university offers scholarships because as well as the entrance exams you might need to separately register for that too. Um, oh, then pay your application fee, and I'm not going to lie, the application fee for Europe may be a bit costly, about uh, 100 euros to 200 euros, but sometimes it can be for free. Um, then sit your entrance exam, or have your interviews, or maybe both in some cases, and then wait for your results. And now I'm going to talk about the general scenarios you're going to phase when um, sending your documents to the university. So you may uh, either register on the university website and just upload all your documents there, or you will have to register on the university's website and then email them the documents. Another thing that may happen is that you will have to um, register on a separate website provided by the institution. So if you're applying to the Netherlands, for example, like I did, you'll have to register on this um, Websites called StudyLink, then you'll get uh, your student number after you register on that website, and you'll have to uh, then register on another website and upload you know, all of your documents on to there. Uh, also, you, you might be asked to send your documents directly to the university, which is probably the most expensive way of applying to university, but yeah. Um, also, if you need to send an entrance exam, your entrance exam will usually be held online. You might need to be asked to scan your whole room, which so like, please clean up and don't have anyone hiding under the table. Uh, and then the, uh, in general, the tests are about your math and English proficiency. And finally, if you're applying with SATs, in most cases you will not be asked to sit an entrance exam, but if you are, uh, no, wait. But if you're applying with SATs and your score doesn't meet the university requirements, you may be asked to write the entrance exam. Yeah, so in summary, you basically have to gather your documents, sit an exam, and then wait for your results. Um, also, you guys should, oh, you're never, whenever you apply to your university and get your acceptance letters, letters, you should know that your university will usually guide you on the visa and the accommodation process. Uh, also, about visas, check your visa's expiration date because um, my, my passport is expiring in July and I have to get a new one and then apply for visas. Um, and then about the accommodation, universities in Europe usually do not have any campuses, so you will have to uh, apply for accommodation provided by your university and the places may be limited. So apply early if you can. Uh, now my personal experience. So I took three A-levels. I did accelerated A-levels this year. I did maths, geography, and business. Uh, and I applied to the Netherlands. And I only really applied to one university. And I don't recommend you guys do that, which is really risky. And the bad part about applying to only one university is that I got waitlisted at first, where I was supposed to get my letter in April. But because I got waitlisted, I ended up getting my letter in May. So don't be sad if you're waitlisted, there's still a chance of you getting it. Oh, and also I'm applying for the business administration course. And finally, even if you don't get into your dream university, you should always remember that there's always something better waiting for you out there, which was said by my amazing classmates here. And you should always... anywhere or not into your dream school, you should remember that it's the university's loss and not your loss, which was said by my amazing geography teacher. <laughs> Uh, oh, 
Um, I know there have been a lot of presentations today, and it might get boring by now, so I'll make it uh, as quick as possible and uh, as interesting as possible. So let's begin. Um, a great mathematician, physician, Albert Einstein once said uh, that you will never fail until you stop trying. So I urge you all to try. Try applying to the best universities in the world, and I hope you get it, and I wish you good luck. Now, um, let's start off with the show of hands. So, how many of you have actually tried doing something today? Anything, anything. Please show me your hand. Great, Mr. Kaskar, Mark. Okay, got some people here, here. Great. Now, next, uh, how many of you actually looked into universities? Perfect. Any universities? Wow. Perfect, perfect. Okay, now how many of you have decided what they want to major in? Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> I didn't know until uh, around a month before the deadline. So that's good. Uh, okay, moving on to top universities. Top universities? Uh, am I too loud? No. Okay. Uh, now, some top universities across the uh, United States include the Ivy League, the eight members, legendary Ivy League. Then it is the UC system, which is the University of California, ten universities there. And then there are some more, like MIT, Stanford, Caltech, and many more. Very famous names, some logos there. Uh, oh, next slide. Saying, take your time and start very early. Okay, your, uh, and we'll jump into the timeline of how you should write essays, etc., how you should prepare. But the school search, it's one of the most important things. For year 12 right now, uh, you must be already doing something on your computer and actually working. But for year uh, 10s and 11s, it's more, more about the mental uh, strengths. It's about the mind game. You have to understand for yourself which university is going to be perfect for you. And I'll show you how. So, uh, some quick facts. USA is very notoriously famous for uh, their liberal arts education. What that means, in simple terms, is that uh, you get to not only learn stuff about your major, so I'm, I will be hopefully majoring in mechanical engineering one day, so not only about mechanical engineering, but I also uh, want to take, if I want to take classes on physics and history and some Russian and language classes, uh, some other uh, interesting courses, I can do that and absolutely the university loves students to do that. Next, uh, bachelor degree in USA as well as in Canada is four years. And for rankings, obviously, I know a lot of you will be using rankings. And it's a good way to uh, judge the academic rigorousness of the, and the reputation of the university. So please use those rankings because those are the most reliable up to date. So QS rankings times uh, higher education rankings and also US best news. Okay. Um, next, uh, I would like to suggest that when you search for universities, you don't only rely on rankings, you also read Reddit and all those different forums which are very, uh, offer th that natural advice of those students. And uh, from talking to current and former uh, those students of those private universities, what I learned is it's important to understand that you have to um, look into rankings of your specific subject more than just the overall reputation of the school. Because some school, let's say um, Harvard, right? Harvard is a well-rounded school. It has top top university, top uh, reputation programs in all the programs, right? All the aspects. But some universities uh, are more uh, specific. So let's say WPI is Worcester Polytechnic Institute. So uh, what it is, it's a polytechnical institute, which is uh, about polytechnical stuff, the tech stuff. So it won't teach you that good of a humanities uh, lesson as it will in the engineering. So be sure to check that out. Let's please move to the next slide. All right, uh, another crossroad you're going to encounter is the public or private. So you have to judge, uh, and we'll move on to, can we turn to the next slide, please? So public are founded by government, it's pretty simple. Private are founded by um, some private um, endowments. They get them for millions of dollars are paid by notable alumni of that school. Um, for example, you know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, Bill Gates, uh, they were graduating um, Harvard. Yeah. Harvard. Right. That's good. Uh, okay. Uh, now, large versus small. Now, this is important and that ties into public. So, generally, publics are more, um, they're larger in scale and they have many more students. So, and that means they have more applicants. With privates, they only offer uh, around, so most of them range from 1,000 students to around 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 students in a class. 
However, publics, large schools like UC system, they can have like up to 10,000, 10, 20,000, 30,000, not in one class, but in one cohort. Okay? And in one class, that will probably be around 2,000 students in one lecture. Uh, now, this is your comfort. Okay? You have to understand what you're more comfortable in, uh, like studying. Would you like a smaller faculty uh, to students ratio? What that means is uh, there are only 20 students per teacher, or you would like one lecture per 100 students. That's very important to understand. What do you excel at? What environment makes you thrive? Okay? Uh, and this will and the large universities usually tend to teach you how to behave in the real world. So you have around thousand people always aiming at one job at Google and you know how to hit it. You know what to say at the interview, and those teach you those uh, skills like dedication, perseverance, and communication skills, as well as persuasion. Next slide, please. Great. So the next factor you should consider is the location and it's the weather. Are you someone who likes California along uh, sunny and warm beaches? Or would you like something like the East Coast with uh, warm summers but also very cold winters? Now, would you like something like Texas? You know what Texas is famous for? Their BBQ, uh, barbecue? Uh, and the, or the some Central America uh, stuff like Ohio uh, State or something like Minnesota where there's a lot of forest. Uh, let's move on. Boston. Good choice. <laughs> Next slide. Please. Okay. Now there is a few more factors. I'll just jump through them so that we get through the admission process really quickly. Uh, one of them is the curricula. Okay. Curriculum is very important, as in in some majors, uh, the schools teach you differently. Okay. And uh, you should look into what courses they teach, and you should tailor that into your own goals. Okay. And we'll talk about goals in a second. Uh, so, culture of the school. Some schools, and I'm, I'm not uh, embarrassed to say this, some schools are uh, party schools. They're known for big, huge, enormous parties. Like uh, thousands, thousands of people there. Some schools are more like for people who are more quiet, geeky. That's totally fine too. So, know what you're going to. Because you should now understand in your mind what is important for you, where will you thrive, what kind of person you are. And then look for universities with that environment. Uh, also, you can look at average employability rate, average uh, wages, how much money will you earn right out of college. Maybe that's important to you. Maybe that's not for some. So that's something to consider. Another thing is the campus. So some campuses are really isolated. They have their own town. It's a large town. They have uh, huge populations. And some are in the middle of the city, like Columbia University, in the middle of uh, the bustling New York City. Now, uh, competition. All right, um, around 70,000 babies are born per hour, uh, up to, or per minute, I can't remember. But it's a very large number and it's spiking, okay? And global population is rising, uh, the number is rising pretty fast. And what that means is, if there are more applicants each year, so let's say there are 1,000 applicants this year, and then 2,000 applicants next year. Uh, but the university can't keep up with that proportionality. They can only admit maybe a thousand students. So what that means is the acceptance rates are lower and it's more competitive. Even those top universities with three to ten percent acceptance rate, they are struggling to house all the students. And believe me, I've been talking to people from uh, like students of that university, and they talk and they hear from admissions office that a lot of people are really qualified, maybe fifty percent, maybe twenty percent, but they still have to cut them because they should pick the best ones. And your goal is to be that best person. Now, um, what, what traits do universities want to see in the students? And I classify them in five categories, right? So, uh, one, it's about being passionate in your field, about your field, and on a deep level. You should commit to it. You should understand that this thing is not, I'm not going to this major because my parent told me, my teacher told me, or my friend told me. That is secondary, okay? That's also important. But the first thing should be you. Do you like that? Do you like that major? Would you be working in, for, in that field for the rest of your life and not feel tired? Because you're, you will be spending at least four years in this university, and this is something to think about. Now, second is being dedicated and resilient. Universities are, again, notorious for very hard and difficult and rigorous coursework and workload. So you will have a lot of sleepless nights. And they want to understand, are you going to put up with that work? Are you not going to give up? Are you going to be resilient? And that's what they're looking for in students. And I know a lot of you are. 
It's just a matter of proving them that you are competitive. Uh, third one, it's higher achiever academically and extracurricularly. It ties in into the hard coursework and workload. What that is, is basically you have to be a higher achiever. They want students who can achieve A stars, A's, and that is among their average. And when you get back to the real world, the average is much lower. So you will be that higher achiever. You will be that next multi-billionaire, and then they like money. So then you will use that money to fund the university. They also have a win-win situation. Now, fourth one, it's to handle uh, time management. So it's time management, handle the work course load, like workload, it's very hard, I know. But for this one, curious, boring, and ambitious for setting the bar high and achieving great things. That is um, one of the most important things. They need to see in you that innovator. They need to see the true believer that you can push the horizons. And that's what they want for their university, because that's what the class should consist of in those top class universities. Next slide, please. Now, uh, we jump into the whole, uh, holistic review process and the admission process in general. So USA, the admissions office uh, there, they use holistic review. So even if you have that one single C somewhere, uh, that might not affect you as much because they tend to first, so they don't look at those small things and just throw your paper out uh, to the garbage can. What they do is they look at everything as a whole. They consider all the aspects of the application, everything that you've written, and then they uh, make their judgment. And then uh, you should pay attention if you're a well-rounded applicant. If you see a lot on the uh, media and also on websites that, okay, I have to be well-rounded, I have to have 10 different extracurriculars, etc., etc., great. But note this, you have to be well-rounded to an extent. What extent is that? First of all, if you're committed to something, you will spend a lot of time. So they want to see that you have that dedication. If you're doing some research, for example, you should be continuously doing that research unless obviously you have some major breakthrough. So, and even after that, you should continue. So for years, if that proves them, that duration, that like effort you put in, that proves them that you're that dedicated person and applicant. So don't do 10 things that you don't want to do and you're not really committed to all of them, like, oh, I'm going to do some MUN just to show them that I can speak, and I'm going to go to some research just because I want that research on my resume. No, do that because do what you love. Pick the main things, pick three main things, five main things, and just do a couple of activities each. Now, um, requirements already. Um, now, I know um, less photos in here, so I'll just go through them, okay? Requirements are uh, for applications. Personal statement, like uh, in other countries, supplemental essays, yes, that's a pain, I'll get into that later. Recommendation letters, test scores, like A-levels, SATs, IELTS, TOEFLs, we'll get into all of that. School profile, report, transcript, and then optional is if you are excelling in music, arts, or some research. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's jump into some of the key ones here, because personal statement, I believe that it's very important to uh, emphasize how different it is from other countries. In USA, uh, you can as well write a similar one to other countries, such as you will explain why this is a major, why are you interested in something. However, what is important is they will already ask you, some of the universities, that in the supplemental essays. So don't mix them together. Don't do the same two essays. Instead, you can use this one to share a glimpse of your personal growth, how you've grown as a person, some instance from your life. Do some reflection. That's what I mean by mind game. You should win this in your mind first, then put it on paper and send it out. So, for this, you should start early. Start thinking what sparked that reflection in your mind. What brought that better you out into the real world? Maybe it's some, um, some uh, disagreement you have with some person. Maybe it's your parents uh, lecturing you once and you're actually understanding what they're talking about. That one day, maybe that made a difference. And my recommendation for this is to complete it by the, senior, by the start of the senior year, which is year 13 in our case. Uh, so please be sure to do that because then supplemental essays come and they're real good. Uh, who mentioned today's? Someone mentioned today's. Um, I, step, I, I made a step up there. I was a couple of hours before the deadline for that. So, um, that's not an achievement. 
Uh, because uh, what is better to do is what Diana did and the others did, is to actually start early and plan this out. Because when you're applying to a lot of universities, uh, each university has those different supplementalists. Some of them may have up to seven, I believe. That was Stanford and Yale. So um, they range from a few words to 650 words. So they might be quite lengthy. And that's a word limit. Don't feel restrained to actually fill that in. Uh, now, if we look into that, some of them are very basic and you can copy paste them sometimes. It's like, uh, why your major of intent? So, let's say you're majoring in physics. So, why physics? What brought you in? And obviously, that shouldn't change based on university. However, if it's something like, why our university? Or why your perfect fit? Please don't go and look and just write that, oh, you're high up on the rankings, that's why I'm including you in my university. Please actually, please look into the university itself. Because if you've done your research, it will be perfect because you know what you love about that university and it's just about phrasing it correctly. Now, some of the more unique ones that I've, uh, that I've encountered are you're teaching a Yale course as a professor. What is it called? What brings you joy? What song represents the soundtrack of your life at this moment? Uh, now, uh, virtually all the standards on your graduate level campus and this basically asks you to write a note for your future roommate. And you can write about Azerbaijan and their cuisine and traditions. Maybe you can cook them something. With something. So, like koma, okay? So that's very that's that's unique and that is an advantage. You might be laughing, but for them in USA, a lot of applicants are coming from USA. There is only a small proportion of international students, and they like diversity. They don't want ten musicians, ten uh, guitar players. They want a guitar player, a clarinet player, a piano player, pianist, and also. Um, so what, what I'm trying to say is, Azerbaijan, you coming out from an Azerbaijani school in Azerbaijan, well, it's a British curriculum, but it's still in Azerbaijan. You carry those traditions into the US and you diversify the class. So you already have that step up. And then um, make them unique to each. Okay. Uh, now, next slide. Recommendation letters, those are straightforward if you uh, have been excelling at the uh, at a subject which is related to your major. Say you want to be a politician, if you're succeeding at politics, then uh, um, obviously you're, because recommendation letters are not teachers lying about you. They should, uh, if they're willing to recommend you, they will remember, and if you succeeded, they will tell uh, them that uh, you have great academic standards, you uh, show great uh, perspectives, potential, and you're, and they might include as well some instances from lessons, which are very important. Um, Okay, there are also non-academic recommendations uh, like clubs, sports, other extracurricular activities. So, like athletes uh, may have coaches which write recommendation letters for them. You may also have research advisors recommendations. And um, what it is, the, what the last point is mentioning is that their number uh, is different for each. So some universities will allow you to submit only two. Some of them will allow up to four or maybe even more. So pick the best one. Next one, please. Test scores. Uh, to emphasize a little on A-levels, and some students may be thinking that you have to take a gap year because results only arrive in August. That's not how it works. Uh, you send them your AS levels, and, um, and you also send them your predicted grades, as well as your IGCSEs, if you only have done those. If you, some of them also require SATs and SAT subjects. Although for this year, uh, the requirements have been lifted because of pandemic. But next year, you have to absolutely check on their websites. Now, uh, some will also require IELTS and TOEFL, depending on how many years of le uh, language of instruction have you done in English. So how many years have you studied in this school, or maybe you have studied in the school before, so they come back. Now, uh, counselor. The counselor, the Snargis, uh, will assist you um, in the uh, transcript, so sending of documents which are official to the school. Uh, so transcript is the last four years, so you're 9, 10, 11, 10, 12. I'm saying that already in the American system because uh, also one important hint from my experience, grade 9 translates to year 10 in the US. So that's better uh, to know that beforehand when you're reading that university website. So last four years, 10, 11, 12, 13. 
Uh, test scores and qualifications will be sent by Ms. Narkis. Uh, counselor evaluation, a recommendation letter, and a school report and profile. An important thing about this last bit, the profile, they judge a student based on the top universities. They judge the student based on what opportunities you have. So let's say if the school offers 20, um, you, you can pick, let's say, eight IGCSE courses per year, okay? If you've picked eight, the maximum, that shows that you're excelling in your environment and you're dying, doing the maximum you can. Now, um, if you're not, then that shows the bad side. Uh, that you're not really dedicated into doing all of them, you're not pushing yourself to the limit. I'll let, so make sure you do the courses that relate to your major and you don't just give up or just be proactive. That's what they want. Next slide, please. Portals. So jumping into the actual filling out the application, uh, there are two main ones you should use. Those are systems and throughout those systems, via them, you can send out uh, the, your documents to the university straight away. So one of them is Common App. I recommend using Common App because it's more user friendly, it's more reliable, and it just looks uh, kind of nicer. It's more user friendly. Uh, believe me, when you're working at 2 a.m., that matters. Now, uh, they only allow up to 20 universities. So if you're planning to get in that extra uh, opportunities for financial aid, scholarship, etc., you will be paying a little extra and you will be sending your documentations. Uh, you can absolutely to more universities and then you can use the other app. So in the sections, in, a section includes, as you can see, the following. It's pretty straightforward except for supplemental essays and the essays. Those take a little more time and figuring out. Also, a very important website to use for essays is the, uh, you can type in college advisors, I believe it's called, .com, and they give you a breakdown of essays and how you should structure. Now, uh, what's something? Second one is Coalition for College. It's also very good, not as user friendly, not, doesn't look as nice, but uh, it's also worth your try. Maybe it's a subjective opinion a little, so you can try and see which one works better for you. Now, those include quite more uh, sections. However, the key difference I noticed is that here, they only allow you up to eight activities to mention in your extracurriculars. However, in Common App, you can include 10. So that might be in the Next, please. Now, um, some universities in, univer in the United States of America do not um, like those systems. They do not uh, go up, so they do not, um, they're not a part of it. So you can't send your documents to them uh, through Common App nor College. Some of them are University of California, that's a separate system, UC. MIT admissions have their own portal. It's also pretty straightforward, simple, user-friendly, do the art here and there, so it's pretty fun. <laughs> now, um, this is the uh, University of Texas at Austin. This is one of the University of Texas uh, universities. Uh, it's a system. It's the University of Texas, there are different universities in it. And um, those, that includes also different schools inside and different systems for Next slide, please. Financial aid. This is an important factor uh, for some, maybe for not others, but I think it's very good to also apply just in case uh, and also to test your luck, really, uh, because the prices can be quite steep. As I checked, some of the top universities rank, uh, rank top 10. They might cost you around 60 to $70,000. So that's a huge amount, and it's good to have that financial aid package. Wait a Right now, there are only five or six need blind universities, and the difference between need blind and need aware is basically need blind, they first take a look at your application and they don't look at if you need aid, if you need um, money or not, or not to enroll. Then, if you pass, then it goes to the financial aid office and then they provide you with money that you require. They have their own calculation formula, and for that, you use uh, CSS profile, you all know SATs, and College Board um, is organizing SATs. College Board also created this, so they house the CSS profile. It's basically the rundown for um, your financial resources of your family and yourself. Now, they're also uh, need aware, which take a look at that, so that decreases your chances of getting admitted if you also apply for financial aid. Some of them require essays as well, so be prepared to write more essays. Uh, Need-based or merit-based. So 
So what that is, is need-based looks at your situation, your financial situation. If you have enough money, then they probably won't give you any scholarships or grants or loans. But if you don't, um, they will try to accommodate you. Now, merit-based, they look at your, um, at your grades, at your different Olympiads, gold medals, etc. Uh, and scholarships, grants versus loans. Financial aid does not mean they just give you money and then they don't want to pay you to pay it back. Okay? Some of them uh, offer scholarships and grants, some of them loans, some of them mixed together. So that's also important to consider. Loans you have to pay back, sometimes with a percentage uh, increase. And uh, scholarships and grants are money you're free to use and you don't ever have to pay for. Next slide, please. Uh, so we co we're concluding our presentation for today. Uh, here are the contact details of uh, us four. Um, emails. You can, if you have any questions, if you have any um, thing you want to ask us about the whole application process, feel free to send us an email.